tone chaser. That thing you hear in your head that you just can't quite get. I'm just telling you what, uh, what you're asking me to answer. Terrific. Um, I'm sorry, you're talking about your dad? Yeah, my dad's the one, one of the most unusual people that I ever met. Um, he's got the best sense of humor. Um, working with him, when we used to work the shithole clubs, he, he was one of the few people who would sit there. We used to play for a place called Avio, which was the American something uh, for Dutch people. Mm -hmm. It was a Dutch club. And in the beginning, you know, you, you got to play a set from starting from 9 o'clock to about 1 o'clock. In the beginning, the people would be permanent and proper. They had their fancy chiffon dresses. And right. the, the men would have their suits on and, right. and their hats and their fancy cigars. Well, by about the middle of the evening, you have to cop a slight toast. <laughs> they would sit there and do the fucking wackiest things. Unbelievable. And I couldn't believe when my dad did this. He would sit there <laughs> and he would walk out, you know, walk off from the stage get in front of all the people you'd walk in front of all the people and you do get in din 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 get in din 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 okay so everybody would do what my dad would do so he'd pull up his pants like this and his, his pants <laughs> all the guys i mean all the straight business looking guys in their 50s would sit there and pull their pants up <gasps> then he would sit there and he'd pull his shirt off the women Oh would pull their tops down. They wow. would do all kinds of things. My dad would sit there and he would march them around. And they would go in circles and they would have a great time. Then he would take them outside the building. <laughs> and there's, you know, the only person playing is my dad. <laughs> and he's sitting there, be whomping on that old horn. And, <laughs> and everybody's doing what he's doing. By the time they would come back, they'd all be barefooted. They'd be just like kids. And I'll tell you, they had the greatest doggone time. Wow. They got their... their um, Inhibitions. There you go. They would let their inhibitions go. Ah, I like the sunglasses, eh? Yeah. I like those. Thanks. Was that, was that a quality your dad had? Yeah. It was something that uh, I'm glad to have experienced, especially since uh, the thing that we're in. Uh, you can't help but have some of that stuff rub off on mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. when... Uh, when you experience it without long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Ed, Edward never really played with your dad then, did he? No. Other than that one gig no. you told me about? No. But he had no desire or his dad, your dad, your, I mean, what? He didn't know. Ed was approaching everything from a very technical standpoint and he was very studious as far as learning certain uh, solos, riffs, you name it. Uh, and he was very shy. Oh, really? Ed was very shy. That was probably the, the main thing, mm -hmm. more than anything else. And I was very shy as well, but it wasn't until I started working with my dad that all of a sudden I figured, what the fuck? Yeah. Do it. Yeah. I get the impression, I mean, I, I might be wrong, but that you, you and your dad are a little bit more kinship, and Edward seems more like your mom. Hmm. I don't think so. I think no. the four of us are... Yeah. ...in a different way. Mm-hmm. Are there... Does your dad have any... Uh, Brothers or sisters? Uh, I'm sorry to say they all ate the big one. They did. How many how many brothers or sisters did they have? Yeah, two brothers, and uh, they ate it. They did? Yeah. Did did they ever know of, of the success of, of his sons or anything? Um, it's hard to it's hard to explain because I don't I don't really know what was going on in their mind. Whether they thought it was success, whether they thought it was whatever. Right. Because uh, Ed and I never looked at the whole situation as success. Mm. Like I said, Ed could care less. Yeah. You know, just right. put him in a room, right. give him an amp, give him a guitar, and Ed's happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my philosophy has always been that I would like to see uh, the great music that Ed is making uh, have it seen by as, or listened to by as many people as possible. And yeah, you have to go through certain channels. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just sit there and make a record or even a tape right. and sit there and go, okay, here it is, world, come listen. Right. Which was sort of Edward's outlook probably. I mean, he probably really did. That was basically Ed's outlook, yes. So you, it was basically you who really, in, in a way, you were his, uh, I don't know, his, his, 
I know what you're trying to say. vision. I mean, it, I know I, what you're trying to say. Yeah. But, uh, I think the best way to put it is that Ed and I work well together. I can compliment what he does, and he compliments what I do. And the bottom line is the music, and we have the greatest time playing. Ed and I can sit there; we can play for hours, yeah. and uh, just have a gas with it. Yeah. Your mom had uh, at least the one sister, right? She was a well. She comes from a family of about twelve. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And she had the sister living here who sponsored the family when they were going to move out. Right. Well, it was actually her cousin. It was actually her sister's daughter. I think it's complicated now. Mm -hmm. It was her sister's daughter who sponsored us to come I over see. here. In fact, Ed had mentioned that when they came over that they really didn't help you no, too much. Not at all. Not, not at all. They were... Uh... Okay, now here's the part where you're probably going to end up having Ed cut out some pieces of tape. Okay. They were very jealous of uh, Ed and I. Ed and I didn't know a word of English, but within a year of uh, getting into the school system of America, I was a squad leader, I was the main guy at, at the school, I was the so-called intellect, I was called Mr. Music Man. Ed was the super fast runner, super athletic, he could do more pull-ups than anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, little things as a kid which probably mean a lot to them at that time. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that, you know, everybody uh, kind of looked at us as, as being different. Really? And, uh, you know, without getting into a family trip too deeply, they yeah. were very jealous. Hmm. Ed and I were very good at what we did, and especially music. Hmm. I just can't imagine them not wanting the best for you. No, they didn't. They didn't want it. Hmm. Hmm. So you, you, you preceded Ed in school. You were two years ahead of Ed, yeah. two grades. Did Ed feel like he had to live up to Big Brother, who was getting the A's I'm and the B's sure and things? Uh, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. I didn't. I didn't do anything intentionally. <laughs> um, I was <laughs> when I was in school. Um, I really felt that it was a waste of time. Hmm. When I came over from Holland, the only thing that really uh, was a, a stumbling block, was a language barrier. I couldn't believe coming over to America and seeing these kids not knowing anything about uh, certain arithmetics or certain, just uh, a number of, let's put it this way. And when I came over here, I felt like I was set back about three years. I'm going like this and I'm cruising, man. I said, Jesus Christ, okay, now I learned how to fucking spell the words. It was, it was very unique. It wasn't as regimented. Uh, the school I went to, for instance, in, uh, and Ed, Ed and I went to in Holland, was almost, it wasn't military, but you better sit there in your position like this. Really? Why? You don't, the fucking teacher beats the shit out of you, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were very, uh, very more disciplined. What was that school called? I think my mom will know. Okay. This uh, is the elementary school, right? Yeah. So I, I think a lot of that, though, uh, obviously helped you. Because you're used to such discipline. You came over here, you probably, you probably enjoyed the, the consumption of knowledge and not having as many I ties on you. I felt... I can still remember the first day my mom took me into school. Wooden floors, desks in all kinds of disarray <laughs> rather than rows. Kids wearing different clothes, you know, wearing a uniform. What's the matter? What's going on around here? And my mom walks in and she goes, Hi, this is Alex. <laughs> <laughs> is that what she says? Is that what she says? Well, because she read it in the book, you know. It was, <laughs> okay, A, okay, Alex. Okay, fine. <laughs> so now I'm Alex. <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, to put it mildly, it was, it was quite strange because I was at an age where I was old enough to understand what was going on, mm -hmm. so I wasn't like a kid who knew nothing completely. So I remember all these things. Yeah. And, uh... Did it scare you? No. I felt, I thought they were very weird. Really? Uh, I thought they were very strange people. You think Edward felt the same way? Um, I think Ed was a little bit younger, since he was two years younger, mm -hmm. he, he came in the first grade. Ed was more of a, um, 
uh, friendly, let's go out and do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think in, in the school there were only about two black, two black people, and Ed's best friend was uh, a black guy. His name was Dexter. Dexter. Yeah, nicest guy you ever fucking met. That was Ed's first friend in America. Yeah. yeah. Nicest guy you ever met. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know. People just kind of looked at us differently. We didn't. We didn't uh, have any prejudices. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any preconceived ideas. And we was poor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I remember all that stuff. It was. It was fun. Hmm. Back to present. Um, the band has just been signed to Warner Brothers. Marshall Burrow becomes your manager. Correct. Did that happen because Marshall was working at the whiskey? I think it was a combination of him working with the whiskey or working at the whiskey and a combination of us being uh, very green, so to speak. We had no guidance, no direction. We didn't know what was going on. He was a good schmusher. Uh, we just didn't know any other avenue. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, you're a kid and what are you going to do, walk down Sunset Boulevard and say, hey, you want to be manager? Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. talked his way into it, uh, and it turned out to be uh, very disastrous. What, what, what happened? I think it was basically his short-sightedness. Uh, he felt, at least in my opinion, he didn't realize that this band was going to last. He just wanted to cash in on the short distance. So any and every opportunity that he had he would go out and cash in on it. I'll never forget the first time we were in Japan, we were to meet with uh, some of the top honchos uh, of the filmmaking industry in Japan because we were going to make a film. Really? Which we eventually did make, which eventually also turned out to be a crap piece of shit. But anyway, uh, we were sitting here at this big meeting, and I got to tell you, uh, Roth, is the kind of person who acts like he knows what he's doing, but doesn't. Right. Okay? So Roth comes walking in, and he's all mm, business-like. You ask him, you know, like, uh, what does rendezvous mean? And he would say, rendezvous. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Give me some lingerie, and I'll think about it. <laughs> so anyway, all of us, all of us were kind of, uh, eh, basically following Roth's footsteps, so to speak, if mm -hmm. you want to if you want to say that, because Ed and I and Mike were the kind of guys who want to play music, go to the hotel room, have a beer, go to the bar, fuck around, do whatever. You know, we're not pretentious. We don't sit there and put on a tie and a suit and right. whatever and the rest of the crap. Right. But anyway, we're sitting in this meeting and Burl, Roth, Michael Anthony, Ed and myself are there before the Japanese people come in. And here is Burl sitting there with a brochure of all the different kind of components you can get for a stereo system. Now we're supposed to be sitting there talking about business as far as what the, uh, the money is going to be involved as to making this, uh, this three song movie. And here he is picking out stereo components. <laughs> One of the main honchos of the Japanese delegation comes in and Burl says, uh, I'd like to have two of these and two of these, okay? And one of these and hold the mustard. And I'm sitting there going, Jesus Christ, what the hell is this guy doing? Well, things went on like that until it just really came, or just got out of hand. So we decided that we should terminate our business relationship. And we said bye, mm -hmm. see you later. So how long was he with the band? About a year. A year. Yeah. The band was signed when? It was uh, I think it was in seventy seven. Seventy seven. What was that? Was the end of the year? Yeah. It was. Yeah. Do you, do you it know was right from? before we recorded the first album. Now it may have been signed in seventy eight. I'm not quite sure, but it couldn't be seventy eight because we went on tour on March. Yeah. Uh, the middle of March. March fifteenth so or something. In seventy eight, so you probably you were signed at end of seventy seven. I 77. can get I can get the uh, exact get dates stuff. for yeah. Well, I yeah. hope so because they have, we have a contract and they have one. 
Hmm. So what was it like? Uh, did you remember the first time that Edward had any chance to to to, to meet Don or anything? Did you could you sense any kind of a an I affinity think, between them? I think there was a relationship that, that kind of uh, blossomed out of the number of hours and years that they had spent together. Mm. Uh, originally, it was basically Ted who ran the whole show. I mean, when Ted walks in, uh, it's like, yes, sir, you obey. It was, I mean, Ted was the, the yeah. taskmaster. Yeah, it was, Ted was the one, and, and I think that's partially the reason, if not the entire reason, why he didn't like to record here, uh, to record 1984, because he felt he had lost all control. Mm. Because Don started uh, to be a more integral part mm -hmm. uh, of the band, and Ted felt like he lost control. Um, again, I'm not bad rapping anyone. I'm not one to to work from 12 to 6. If you happen to have a musical idea, and if you think you can perform better at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you have the facility right there, why not? Right. Ted is the kind of person who says, all right, we record from 12 to 6. The moment the clock strikes 12, okay, be creative. Play. Now, maybe I'm being a pussy by not being able to perform in those conditions. Although under most times I have done. I think that Ted's 12 to 6 approach limits the band to certain things. It's like you have to go in there and you gotta play. And then all of a sudden, when it's 6 o'clock and your studio time is uh, is over, you may have a better idea. But then what do you do? Sit there and play with it, you know, and stick it up your nose? Mm -hmm. And that's why 5150 was so good for us. But I gotta admit, uh, we did go to excess because we would sit in here, and when I say we, it was basically Ed and Don would sit in here and play till all hours of the morning. They sometimes, I swear, would lock themselves in for two days at a time. But uh, all I can say is the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. The best, some of the best music I've ever heard came out of this studio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your, uh, looking back at the first record, how do you, uh, how do you see it? Well, what was it like being in the studio? I mean, with major producers, major label. What was Edward thinking? What was I was so I was so uh, busy thinking about my personal uh, not only performance but sound that I really didn't pay a hell of a lot of attention to what everybody else was going through. I'm sure that Ed had uh, things in his mind that uh, probably bothered him. I'm sure that Mike did the same. And since Roth only sang one line of it at the time, <laughs> I guess it really didn't make a hell of a lot of difference to him. Uh, I was uh, I was originally not uh, not happy with it. With the first record, really? no, I was not happy with it. I, it was great material, and uh, you know, at one point, and sorry, Don, but I got to say this: at one point in time, uh, Don did not have uh, all the mics plugged in properly, and one of my kick drums was not on. So I'm playing this kind of intricate thing on the kick drums, but nobody can hear it. <laughs> and it turned out sounding like a, some mongi playing drums. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Really? Is yeah. that actually on the album? Yes. What, what song is it? Uh, I'm the one. And uh, Don uh, apologized. And I uh, accept his apology. I mean, you know, what, what's mm -hmm. there is there, and mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do about it now. What 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 is your relationship with Don? I mean, how, how did you work with Don through the years? I thought Don, or I think Don is probably the best fucking engineer that ever lived. The guy is amazing. From a technical standpoint, as far as splicing tapes and putting tapes together, from a uh, an ear, the guy has an ear like you wouldn't believe. I mean, he can hear a little washer, uh, you know, making sound on, on one of the drum uh, tuning pegs. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he's fantastic. And uh, I hope that we can do this next record with him together. Hmm. So you think it will be Ted, and we don't have to put this in here, but it will be Ted and Don? Well, Ted definitely. 
and Don, if he wants to work with Ted. Oh, I see. It's uh, it's kind of a a creative thing because, you know, how can I say it? We have compared tapes uh, of what Don has done as to what Ted has done of the identical stuff. I mean, here are the masters. You go mix your version, and you go mix yours. And I'll tell you, Don's it sounds like a Concord. Ted's sounded like a, uh, a crashed 707. <laughs> mm. And Ed and I feel very strongly about that. We're going to fight to get Don in on this project. Mm -hmm. uh, Sammy doesn't want to really work with Don because Don does have his quirks, but then who doesn't? Mm -hmm. You know, I wake up in the morning sometime on the wrong side of the bed, mm -hmm. and you know, you sit there and you wipe your butt, you don't get it all, and then five <laughs> minutes later you sit and you've got diaper rash. <laughs> Very graphic. Yeah. No, we, we were hoping that, uh, that Don will uh, be able to do this record. Yeah. Hmm. How long did it take to, to record the first record? Seven days. Seven days. And then Warner said, you guys... Uh, to go on the road? He was supposed to be a three-week tour to open up for Journey in Montrose, and the record took off like a big sky boom. <laughs> okay, well, the three weeks turned into 11 months. Hmm. We played with, uh, you name it, we did some of our own gigs, uh, but I think one of the major things for access to public was when we opened up for Black Sabbath. They run a 10th year anniversary tour, and every night was sold out, and it was uh, about between 10 and 20,000 people. Mm. Uh, we did have a few uh, freak shows, such as with the Stones, where there were 120,000. And we did some of the outdoor stuff, uh, like, uh, what was it, the Cotton Bowl in Texas. Uh, was it called Texas Jam? Where it was about a hundred thousand. This isn't the. This isn't in '78 though. This yes, is, oh, this is '78. You, you play with the Stones yeah. in '78. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, New Orleans. God. Wasn't that a little heavy for uh, four local lads from Pasadena? Um. Uh, well, let I me mean, say it was interesting because uh, you know Greg Emerson, who does my drums. Mm -hmm. He sets them up and he tears them down and he polishes them or at least hires some kid for five dollars <laughs> to do it for him while he's sitting there smoking a joint. Uh, what's his name? God, now I'm starting to lose it. Uh, Mick Jagger is his idol. Oh. I mean, there's no bigger fan <laughs> of Mick Jagger than Greg Emerson. Well, the night before the sound check that we were going to do the show in New Orleans, Greg and I went out to have a few drinks. I used to do an old trick where you do this. You walk down the hall, and when you get to the wall, you go like this. Hey. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> Greg followed my, my footsteps, and he didn't know how to do the trick, so he actually walked into the wall and broke his face. <laughs> God. I saw him laying down on the ground like this. Well, blood spurt out between his fingers. I'm going, Greg, you hook up? Like, oh, no. <laughs> anyway, next morning, we're getting ready for sound check, and we're going to go down and take a look at this at the gig. And here's Greg with his face all puffed up like this. I mean, it, it stuck out further than my nose does. So he had to put on dark sunglasses. He put on dark sunglasses so dark that he couldn't even see where the hell he was going. Here he is on stage with his idol. Mick Jagger, <laughs> who's coming over to check out the equipment. <laughs> because we had just gotten back from Japan, and I just got the Octobands, and he wanted to know what they were. And also Jagger's asking me, what, do you, what are these? Sir? Hey, what are these? Drugs? I said, well, they're Octobands. Anyway, so Greg's standing there, wanting to meet his idol. And he can't <laughs> see him. <laughs> he couldn't see him. <laughs> his, he had his blackout glasses. <laughs> and the lights are dark to begin with anyway. So he, he just stood there. <laughs> I thought it was funny as shit. How many dates did you play with the Stones? Um, I think in all total, probably about two. Really? We, play, we played once with them um, in 78. 
at uh, at the Superdome in New Orleans. In New Orleans, <clears throat> and after the show, uh, Jagger came over and he said, uh, "I'm never playing with you guys again." <laughs> he just blew us off the stage. He really said that? Yeah. He really came over and said that? Yeah. He says, you, "You're never playing with me again." That's why I was surprised that in I think it was '80 or '81, uh, we played with them again at the Orange Bowl. Is that in Texas? That was in uh, Florida. Florida. Hmm. And afterwards, he just said the same thing. <laughs> really? He said, "Never again." <laughs> this was this was their tour when they had the uh, the Chauvin uh, uh, sponsoring sponsorship, it? and it was just kind of like a mini tour, but it was all major cities and major. Uh, stadium stuff. Wasn't it kind of unheard of for a band like Van Halen to, to be able to open for the Stones? I don't know. I don't know what the politics were. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was involved. I don't know how it happened, but uh, it just happened. They, they called us up because they had Journey open up for them at one point and they just had different bands opening up and uh, it, was a, it was definitely a fun show. Was it? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, it, Jagger is definitely one of the top performers that guy puts out. I watched him and he's good. Really? Huh. And you what, he's almost 40? Yeah. I hope yeah. I have uh, at least 90% of his energy <laughs> by the time I'm yeah. 40. Yeah. And you guys did a lot of shows opening for Journey? No, we opened up for, yeah, that was, that was the original tour that we started out on, 78. Journey. In 1978, we opened up for Journey was top bill, Montrose was second, and we were third. We never, or rarely have ever, got a sound check. Really? Uh, but it was definitely uh, learning the ropes. Was it? Because we blew those motherfuckers off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> but the fun is the fun part. The really fun part was playing with uh, with Sabbath. Really? Because uh, yeah, they were they were uh, an idol. That whole band, I idolized them when I was a kid. Uh, and being able to play with them was, was definitely a thrill. Hmm. And Edward listened a lot to Tony too, didn't he? Pardon? Edward listened a lot to Tony Iommi. He listened to him a lot, but I don't think he was quite uh, impressed. Impressed. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, the, it's your first tour, you know, the band is out there, and it's like hotels and stuff. I mean, was it, was it crazy? Yeah, definitely. I think it was like putting a little kid in a candy store. Uh, there just wasn't enough to grab, you know what I mean? We, uh, I don't know how the rest of the guys reacted, but basically I just, I went hog wild. <laughs> Everything you've always heard about rock bands and their, uh, uh, their adventures, well, it was definitely true there. Destroying hotel rooms? Uh, that got to be very boring. Uh, very quickly. No, seriously, really? it was, yeah, it became very boring very quickly. It was nice to once take a chair and throw it through a window or uh, a TV set, but, uh, okay, one TV set, one window, big deal. Mm -hmm. Got very boring. Mm -hmm. I think the most interesting thing of the entire uh, situation of going from town to town, city to city, hall to different hall, playing, was meeting different people hmm. and just uh, it was a rare opportunity most people don't uh, aren't that lucky to mm -hmm. be able to go out and do that mm -hmm. uh, we met anywhere from Japanese people to English people to Canadians to Americans to Midwesterns to people out there in the middle of Idaho mm -hmm. and it was it was nice would it, was it, did Ed interact a lot with, with people he met? I mean, was he... Was uh, again, I was so wrapped up yeah. in my own thing and watching people that I really didn't pay attention. Uh, Roth was always trying to be the, uh, I know this and I know that and I know where to go. I mean, when we're in Paris, he, he thinks he knows how to talk French. Okay, <laughs> well, so he asks for where's a hamburger and they, they send to the bathroom. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, I got along with uh, a, a number of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was it was very well, like I say it was interesting, uh, and I think uh, Roth spoiled a lot of it by being so 
so-called pseudo-knowledgeable. Mm. We go to Mexico or we go down south uh, below the border, we go to South Africa, we go to uh, Argentina, and Roth sits there and he thinks he knows how to speak the lingo. Okay, well he knows the words, but he doesn't know the inflection, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know certain things. And I'm not knocking him really, it's just that I had a great time watching and laughing. Because I see these people looking at him going, all right already, enough with the fucking yapping. Let's start playing a song we play, you know, we play good fucking dinero to watch you play musica. <laughs> Mm. It's like as if I was if I was to walk out and say, "Hello, America. Right. How are you right. today? Look at all the people <laughs> here tonight." Ay, ay, ay! <laughs> I got tapes for you. He's just talking so doggone slow. Jesus Christ, I have enough time to sit there and look up each word in the, in the, um, in the vocabulary dictionary, you know? <laughs> if you ever listen to uh, the Spanish people, Spanish talking people, they said, you should want to go to the talk so doggone fast, you don't even know where you're going forward or backwards. And when Dave was sitting there, yeah, he picks his words and he knows what he's saying, but it's almost like, Okay, let's see. That word is on page 49. Quick. Okay, I know what that means. Now, before he gets to the next word, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> what, what, what was the first tour called? Was there a name for the tour? Uh, no, not, no. not in uh, 78. Uh, in 79, it was basically, uh, I think it was called the uh, Van Halen Invasion. Van Halen Invasion. And, uh, so, so from se you went out in March of 78. Out till, till about December. Till December. Yeah. Then they came back and what? Started working on, on the next record. No, we didn't start working on it. We recorded it in the next ten days. Really? Where did the uh, where did all the tunes come from? Ed was writing on a, on a, on tour. He he did. And uh, a lot of the songs were part of what was the original demo tape because we had the original demo tape had about uh, 30 songs on it. So what we didn't use for the first record, we saved for the next one. Really? And it was just a little bit of rearranging mm -hmm. and having uh, Ted's expertise and picking the winning horse, so to speak, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as to what we were going to put on the record. So you were actually playing tunes from the second album on the first tour in the set? No. No. No, we never did that. But you, but you did have the tunes already right. on the demo tape. Right. What were some of the tunes? Uh, things like um, Dead or Alive. Uh, you know, it's funny he asked me this because I can't even remember what the heck was on there. Dance the Night Away you had, I think? Yeah, Dance the Night Away. Uh, Beautiful Girls. Beautiful Girls. Yeah, those were all songs that were already written huh. two years ago, huh. or prior rather. So you came back and recorded the second album when? As soon as we got back. We yeah. had two days off, then we were in the studio, did ten days of studio work, uh, of actual recording, and after that, uh, well, the mechanics had to take place, which mm -hmm. was mixing, mastering, pressing, mm -hmm. and the rest of the crap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the second album was released when? Uh, not too long after whatever we got done. I wish I knew the dates, because I don't. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember. Quite honestly, I, I'm personally not happy with the, with the second record. You're not? No. Less the, happy than you were with the first? Yes. Really? Less happy. Reason being, the material was so damn strong. It was so good. Like somebody get me a doctor. Mm -hmm. And just because we had to sit there and crank out another album, uh, we just didn't have the time. Hmm. It, it was recorded in the fashion that the Beatles used. used which was, uh, you know, pen, guitar, just a little bit to the right, drums in the middle, bass on the side, vocals just wash over, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, had we the technique and the capability, the time, and the interest of everybody involved to record it with the machinery that's available to you, mm -hmm. then that album would have been much better. Hmm. 
Uh, I was I was very uh, upset. Ed doesn't care so much about it. He says, "Well, we can always write another song." Right. I that felt I felt that uh, that record could have been could have been huge. Huh. That was Edward's feelings. Basically, we'll just do it on the next record or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says, "I can always write another song." Hmm. Hmm. What was what was Sunset Sound like to work at it? Well, since it was the first time that we uh, had ever gone into a studio and we'd never experienced really what it was like, it was basically Ted running the whole thing. Mm. He would say, okay, 12 o'clock, you'd be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how the rest of the guys felt. I was, I was quite a bit nervous. You were? Yeah. Even the second record, you were still nervous? Second record? Uh, no, second record, I was bored. <laughs> and I wasn't happy. Mm. You think a lot of that energy may have been lost because you had to record from... No. I just think it was... Uh, I had a definite idea of the way I wanted the drums to sound. You did. And over the course of the years, over the six records, I think the uh, the one person who has the, the, uh, the best handle on it is Don Landy. Mm. He knows what I want out of a drum sound, and he knows how to get it. Don didn't have as much input on those records. The early records. Don at that time was really, as far as I could see, uh, I may be mistaken, but as far as I could see, he was basically uh, a technician. He was he was an engineer. If if Ted said, okay, cut it here, he would do that. Okay, mm -hmm. pop this uh, track over there, he mm -hmm. would do that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, Don knew how to get sound and knew how to get the ring out of a drum if it rang, or to get the best sound out of the the. Uh, the guitar or bass and vocals, but as far as a, an identifiable sound, something that was different, I don't think Don was allowed to have as much input, and I don't think he knew exactly what it was that we wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I'm not happy with the record. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, I, I, that record stinks. As far from a technical standpoint, right. I don't like it, and uh, I'm sure that Ed's going to have his uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as bad as I make it seem mm -hmm. no, I know. to sound, I know. but I'll tell you that record could have been ten times better. Mm -hmm. It had oh, the music was just it was incredible. Mm -hmm. What about the third record? That's when we started to uh, spend a little bit more time recording a record. That record took three weeks. Well, we spent more time. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just, uh, and we had more input. And I gotta, I gotta hand it to, uh, to Ted, is that he is one person who is willing to allow the band to have input. He's not the kind of guy who'll walk in and say, "All right, this is my record. This is the way it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. You don't like it? Tough shit." Mm -hmm. He's not like that at all, because three of the songs on the last record, on 1984, were recorded without Ted's presence. And he heard it, and he said, yeah, well, you know, any other producer would sit there and tell you, let's do it again, because I wasn't there. Right. But he said, this is such a good take, let's keep it. Well, uh, what, what three tunes were those? It was uh, Jump, All Wait, and Drop Dead Legs. And so I really admired him for that. Because anybody else would have said, hey, fuck this noise, man. Throw that shit in the garbage. Let's do it again. Yeah. So Ted knew how to deal with Edward and... Uh, oh, definitely. oh, definitely. I mean, first, to be a producer, <laughs> aside from the fact that you have to sit there and, well, produce, uh, which means putting the songs together, being creative, uh, helping out with harmonies, uh, making sure that everybody's on time right. and getting it done, you have to also be part-time psychoanalyst or psychologist because not everybody is in a, the same up mood at the same time. Mm -hmm. Some people's biorhythms might be down, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the words are. Uh, so he was, he was very good at that. Do you feel like he brought out in you and Edward that more of the uh, third record, more of the sounds, more of what you heard was, was becoming a little clearer now? I think it was starting to get there. I think Ted started to realize uh, that we had a different idea of the way the record should sound than what Ted had in mind, mm. because it's very easy by t done. It's very easily done by twisting knobs to make us sound like the Doobie Brothers. 
-hmm. I think one of the one of the uh, the major assets that Ted has is that his attitude towards recording the band the way they sound rather than recording the music and then doctoring it to the point where you can make a sound like Queen. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what he's good at, and, he's, and that's why he is Ted Tumbleman. Mm -hmm. hmm. What about the fourth record? Fourth record, I think, was uh, a little bit. Uh, Going off in a direction of overproduction. Really? I think there were too many, uh, too many inputs. Uh, there are songs that uh, basically Ed and I were not interested in doing. Uh, Ted wanted to look for a hit single. Uh, Roth was always on a, a weird tangent somewhere. I mean, he was never really into the hard rock stuff. Uh, yeah. I would have never put a song like Dancing in the Streets on that record. That's not Van Halen. That's garbage. That's fucking shit. You know, dancing in the streets. Jesus Christ. Let Martha and the Vandellas play it. <laughs> Let them sell a million copies and they can buy new lipstick and sunglasses or something. <clears throat> no, that's, that was not Van Halen. But we went along with it because somehow Roth managed to convince Ted or vice versa that it was going to be a hit single. And uh, maybe they were right, maybe not, because now there's that song by Jagger and Bowie, yeah. Dancing in the Streets, <clears throat> same song. Right. Well, I'll tell you, their version sure as hell kicks the shit out of the one we did. <laughs> and even that's not selling, so there. <laughs> hmm. No, I was, I was very disappointed in that record because uh, there was so much good music on it. It could have been better. Uh, all I can say, okay, you're gonna go to number five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think number five was uh, was fun. It was uh, a little bit misdirected, I think. In what ways? Uh, musically, the fifth record was at a time when video started coming uh, into the picture, and it was becoming much more prominent. And everybody was looking for a, a hit single. So rather than getting a great album. Uh, there was more concentration or more concentrated effort until we were getting a hit single, which turned out to be uh, Pretty Woman. Okay, it was a good shot. It ended the charts and it got up in the top ten, and we spent $40,000, which is a very low amount for a video. But anyway, we did the whole routine. And when I, when I say that the whole thing became misdirected was because what we should have done was the record that Ed wanted to make, which was music, and let it take care of itself. And the proof is in the pudding. Ed and Don made 1984. Sure, I participated, I played, but the people who made that record were Ed <coughs> and Don Landy. And it went to number two. Hmm. And the single went to number one. And if Ed hadn't been so stupid to play on Michael Jackson's record, then Michael Jackson wouldn't have been number one, and he would have been number two, and we would have been number one. But, no, I'm serious, that's that's really the way I feel. Look, you know, nobody can predict what the hell's going to go on. Right. And, but I'm just looking in things, that, looking at things, uh, what I think was a reasonable uh, objectivity. 1984 went further and higher in the charts than any record that yeah. we ever made. Yeah. How high did the first record get, do you know? I think it went to 14. Do you know what the second one did? No, I do know what the third one made. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, the fourth one made number four, and then it dropped to 40. Really? Well, it was some kooky idea uh, that was instilled in Roth's mind <laughs> by the one person named Ted Templeman. He said, when Rod Stewart wants something done, and he's not happy with what the company's doing, he walks in the middle of a board meeting and he voices his opinion. Okay. So Roth tries it, barges in a board meeting and speaks his mind. And the next week, our record went from number four in Billboard to number 40. <laughs> Yippee, yay, yay. Yeah, good stuff, Roth. <laughs> now, I, can't blame, I can't blame Dave. It wasn't his fault because he only did what uh, was suggested to him. What did, what did 
he want done or what, what oh it was just the company was not really backing us they were not I promoting see. they were not uh, pushing they were not working the, the record they were not putting it on the radio stations they just it was a mess they were just not doing what we felt uh, would be beneficial to the record mm -hmm. I mean why go halfway you know mm -hmm. you got a record number four in the charts why not push it let's see what happens mm -hmm. with it they just were not 100% mm -hmm. uh, uh, gun-ho I mean uh, didn't one basically see uh, Van Halen as a, a one-shot kind of, I mean, they didn't... I don't Originally, yes. But then, my personal opinion, now I'm not speaking for anybody else except for myself, in my opinion, Van Halen became a workhorse for the company. Because Carl Scott, at one point in time, said, uh, Van Halen is just going to sell a million records every time out. It's a guaranteed commodity or a quantity, whatever the word is, whatever you want to use. They never were going to push it any further to make it superstar, oh, to I make see. it anything. It's guaranteed. You mm -hmm. sell a million records, okay. Mm -hmm. Warner Bros. makes X amount of money. Mm -hmm. We make X amount of money, fine. You'll never be superstar. Okay, fine. If that's your attitude, you know. Right. And uh, in the meantime, while Van Halen was making money for Warner Brothers, they would sit there and go on these weird uh, tangents and, and pick up these weird acts and try to make... You know, everybody wants to be a star. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be the guy who discovers this band or discovers this band or manages this band. Or, I'm the one who found these guys. Look what I do for the company. You know what I mean? Well, in the meantime, you've got Rocksteady, Van Halen, right back there pumping money into the company. <clears throat> And, well, we were unhappy with that. And that's why uh, Dave went in there and uh, did his thing. And uh, I can honestly say it was not his fault that uh, the whole thing fell apart. Mm. I think it was really uh, the suggestion of Ted Templeman. Mm. And he denied it. He says, I never said that. I was there, man. I was there. <laughs> I never said for you to go out and do that. <laughs> Bullshit. So you meant by the fourth album? You can, uh, you can get a hold of me on my uh, Instagram page anytime. Steve.Rosen.Guitar.Pix. Uh, or you can check me out on Facebook. I think if you type in Steve Rosen Tone Chaser, you'll find me there. Um, so, okay. Bye.